Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for attending this morning. I'm Derek Wilding. I'm from the Centre for Media Transition at University of Technology, Sydney. I'm also the president of the Australian chapter of the International Institute of Communications. Um, I'm going to hand over to Dave in just a moment to introduce our keynote speaker. Just a couple of um, uh, administrative aspects first. So this morning we'll run with um, our keynote address from Rod Sims. Um, there'll then be a short uh, video that we'll show while we set up the first panel. Um, the first panel is the competition panel. There'll then be a break and we'll go into the second panel on news and journalism. After that, there'll be a short lunch period and you're welcome to, to join us for that. Um, just a, a, a quick note on um, uh, how we're approaching um, the sessions today. The first session with, with Rod um, is an open session where um, you're welcome to uh, for those of you who are from the media, welcome to report, um, obviously, what, what, uh, what he says. The second two sessions, both of the panels, are run under Chatham House rules, which is the standard IIC policy. So um, please, no attribution um, of, of matters that are, are raised in, that, uh, in those two panels. Um, but if you would like to arrange for an interview with one of the speakers at the end of the session, please do um, contact uh, Joe Ryan from the IIC. Thank you again, and I'll hand over now to Dave. Good morning, and thank you, everyone. Um, I think this is always a very simple job for me uh, to introduce someone who really needs no introduction. Um, the ACCC chairman, Rod Sims, I think, is probably uh, one of the busiest persons in Australia at the current time. Um, the, um, I think we've, we've got uh, 20 minutes of um, Rod's talk. Uh, that talk is, um, as Derek says, going to be videoed. Um, we're then going to have uh, 10 minutes, um, although Rod has said he can take a, a little bit longer than that um, on questions and answers. And I would ask, though, when we get to questions and answers, that if people, people could please name their organisation and, and um, we'll have a microphone hopefully come around if people could speak clearly. Uh, I'm sure there will be some very interesting questions and answers. Those questions and um, answers to Rod, um, because we would like to ensure throughout this conference there is an open discussion, um, they will, the questions and answers also we request our Chatham House rule, that they are not attributed in relation to that. Um, and as Derek said, if you want to ask particular questions of Rod um, that you do want to publish, please do so afterwards and please contact him in relation to those things. Uh, and obtain um, any consent in relation to, to that. Thank you, and then I'll hand over to Rod. Thank you very much, Rod. Thanks for putting so long. Um, sorry, I'm standing at the podium, but uh, it's just a bit too hard over here. Right, that works. Sorry about this. That's the way you always want to start a speech, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, look, thanks very much, uh, Dave, and thanks very much to the IIC for the invitation. Uh, these are really important issues that we're all focusing on, and they're very complex issues, so it's great to have a chance to chat about them with you. I'm going to focus more on news and journalism, just because in 20 minutes it's worth just narrowing down a bit. Uh, Scott Gregson will focus on consumer and privacy issues later on, so we are a bit of a double act. So uh, obviously the federal government uh, asked us to undertake this inquiry and that unlocked our information gathering powers and we published our preliminary report in December. It had 11 preliminary recommendations and eight areas for further analysis and now we're really focused on, yes, a bit more um, general analysis but also uh, wanting feedback on our recommendations and analysis so that we can tune or completely adjust those recommendations to make sure that what we come out with is, uh, is right. Uh, a key issue uh, is clearly the commercial model for funding news and journalism. Uh, journalists employed in the print sector have uh, the employment there has fallen by 20% in the three years to 
2017. So we're not saying that's all due to the rise of digital platforms, Facebook and Google, um, but in various ways they've had a pronounced effect. I'm going to talk about four things today. One is the importance of journalism in our society. Uh, secondly, uh, the impact that digital platforms have had on media and journalism. Uh, and we're not just talking about reduction in advertising revenue or diversion of advertising revenue. We're talking about the many ways that the digital platforms operate which have an effect on the media companies. And of course, um, uh, the internet and digital platforms have also facilitated uh, additional media. Uh, so there's definitely pluses and minuses. Uh, thirdly, I'm just going to talk about how all the issues come together. I've enjoyed some of the international commentary saying, why isn't the ACCC just sticking to this issue? Uh, the answer, of course, is that our terms of reference said we should look at these issues. And, but, but the bigger issue is you can't segment these issues. Once you segment them, you lose the plot. You, you lose your ability to come up with anything sensible to address them. So you've got to deal with them in the whole, and I'll come back to that. And finally, and depending on time, I'll talk about our proposals, but uh, I hope those who are interested have already read that bit. So news and journalism... Uh, clearly, and look, I'm paraphrasing the, uh, the speech in the interest of time and also a more uh, interactive performance than just reading a speech, uh, but clearly news and journalism is a public good. We all benefit from it. Uh, that's why it's different to other commercial activities. We benefit from the informed commentary. We benefit from uh, better informed citizens. We benefit from the investigative journalism, which holds people to account, uh, sometimes irritatingly us, uh, and we benefit from just those uh, keepers of the record in various ways at various events, such as uh, court hearings and things the like. So it's not just the in-depth journalism that we're talking about, it's journalism generally we're talking about. So I don't think we can simply leave it to market forces um, and also, as I say, there's other things going on which make it hard for me media and journalism to compete on their merits. So there's both those aspects going on. Um, the public good element, you can't just leave it to market forces, plus the not able to compete on their merits. They're separate things but like everything else, linked. Uh, let me talk about the impact of digital platforms now on news and journalism. Now, Google and Facebook particularly, who are the main focus because they're the dominant players, they have been stunningly commercially successful. I mean, I really admire their commercial model. Um, it, it's been quite ruthlessly pursued um, uh, and it's made a lot of money for the shareholders of those companies. But it's done that because it's delivered great services to everyone in this room. Uh, I am on record as saying I'm not on Facebook, which I did say I would, then I thought, no, I won't. But anyway, just don't have time. Thank you, Dave, for that let out. Um, but I do use Google half a dozen times a day, including on how do you spell a word um, to, through to something that really matters. And, and so clearly the effect of these digital platforms has been profound and, and nobody's denying that and we could spend all the time talking about what wonderful new services we've got but I want to focus on the issues that are before us. So there's obviously the impact on the financial model of journalism. Journalism of course uh, had these little uh, newspapers which caught people's eyeballs which therefore got advertising and uh, that model has now been upended by digital platforms. And of course, Google and Facebook are getting 80% of the growth in digital advertising. They get close to 80%, 78% um, uh, of the digital advertising as it stands. And so that has uh, taken a lot of the revenue sources from journalism. But if that's all we were talking about, then we wouldn't worry about it. Um, 
but it has uh, reduced the number of journalists. Had, it had, but there has been, I mean, it's that plus the other things I'm going to come on to. Um, but I've mentioned earlier that reduction in uh, the number of journalists, and um, it's quite it's quite pronounced. We're trying to assess to what extent that means uh, an underproduction of news and journalism. It's a very tricky task, but we'll try and see how we can sort of triangulate around it a bit. Of course, I mentioned there's been uh, benefits. You've had new entrants, The Guardian, Crikey, BuzzFeed, Daily Mail, um, who weren't there before. Uh, the the um, online world has facilitated uh, their existence and they certainly add a valuable extra dimension to our news commentary and that's to be welcomed. Of course, growing up in Australia, we had a lot of concentration in our media, Murdoch, Packer, etc. So having this diversity that has come about through the online world has been a plus. But the issue I want to go to is how the digital platforms make it difficult for media to compete on their merits. Now, one example which is, I think, interesting is the lack of clarity around the ad tech supply chain. And this has been of particular interest to some of the media companies. Uh, it's argued that the opacity around the delivery of the programmatic advertising, where is it shown, to whom is it shown, what cut the intermediaries get, um, uh, prevents advertisers making informed choices and hampers the ability of online publishers to properly take advantage of their, the quality offering being the fact that you're going to have an ad next to uh, important news stories. So that's an issue we're trying to get to grips with and we certainly welcome any comment on that. But there's a range of other ways. Um, there's um, uh, a lack of transparency in the ranking of news content. Uh, that makes it hard for the media companies to work out how to provide the most attractive offering. There's uh, the way algorithms work and don't recognise the original sources of the stories, which makes it very difficult to put a lot of time into. I mean, the number of stories I've heard of, we investigated this for three months, we had this great story up and within two seconds it was copied and enlarged on and you wouldn't have known it was our story, so very hard to monetise it. Um, the uh, restrictions on the type of advertising available on certain formats within the digital platforms, um, the uh, allegation that news content uh, is lowly ranked if it sits behind a paywall, where people are trying to, media companies are trying to get subscriptions, and of course the whole issue of snippets and first click free, uh, just a range of ways we're looking at uh, to determine how much the way the digital platforms operate make it very hard for media to compete on their merits. In addition, the atomization of news delivered via digital platforms makes it difficult to get brand awareness. Um, and this, I think, is an important issue. Um, do you know where your news is, is coming from? Uh, in a sense, the digital platforms have an interest in anonymizing things. They are the source of your news uh, and it makes it hard for the media companies to get that brand awareness. Now, I think it's important to note that the digital platforms haven't replaced the media businesses as creators or producers of news and journalism. If they had, we might just treat this as creative destruction. You know, the horse overtaken by the car, <coughs> taxis overtaken by Uber, uh, things move on, things change. But I don't think you can see that here. Uh, Google and Facebook aren't creating news stories in Australia, but they do select, curate, evaluate, rank and arrange news stories produced by third parties which disseminates those parties' content. 50% of the traffic to Australian news media websites comes via Google and Facebook. Therefore, they do have a significant influence over what news and journalism Australians uh, do and don't see. 
But we do have issues around the risk of filter bubbles, unreliable news, and the impact this is having on society more broadly. So, as I say, it's not as if they've invented a better mousetrap. They've just got a business model which makes it very difficult for the media companies to operate. Um, they are curating, evaluating, they're ranking what you see, but they're not actually producing the content. So we think that those issues of how they disadvantage media, issues around filter bubbles, issues around unreliable news are important issues. And they're important because of the dominance of Google and Facebook. Um, Google has a virtual monopoly on search and Facebook is by far the dominant social media platform. Uh, the number two, three, four, five, six, eight, and nine is daylight and then there's number 10, uh, a competitor. So when you are in that position of dominance, uh, it does mean that you are looked at differently. It does mean that behaviour and things you were doing when you weren't dominant, which were okay, suddenly, when you are dominant, need to be looked at through a different lens. This is standard uh, competition policy theory. There's nothing new in that point. Um, it's well understood in competition circles that if you have a company doing something when they're small, a dominant company doing that same thing could then be held to do something anti-competitive. So Google and Facebook have now, through their stunning commercial success, got themselves in a position where uh, what they do has to be looked at in a different way. So let me just turn to these interlinked issues. Um, Media and advertising are two sides of the same coin, really. Advertising has traditionally funded journalism and media, commercial media, uh, uh, are classic examples of two-sided markets. Um, Google and Facebook are extremely good at getting consumer attention because they offer great products. Um, they attract consumers uh, because uh, of their value in search and their value as a social network. The more users they attract, the more valuable they are to advertisers. They do have market power, which I think is self-evident, and we've spent a lot of time analysing and establishing that in the report. Um, and that market power translates into market power in a range of different markets. Their power in advertising relies incredibly, of course, on the extensive amount of data they collect uh, from consumers directly using their service, but consumers doing other things as well through agreements that they have to be able to collect your data. Um, and how much consumers are aware of how much data is being collected, how much they're aware of what's being done with it, I think is very much an open question, but our view is they aren't much aware of all of that. And certainly it's very hard to opt out of those things uh, because sometimes you just don't have a choice, you don't have the ability to do that. So there's very much a connection between market power, competition, data collection, privacy, media, advertising. Another illustration of that, actually I should just mention the German Competition Authority's recent decision. Um, the German cartel office found that Facebook ex Facebook's extensive collection of its users' data, uh, not only from Facebook-owned sites, but also from third-party sites, websites and apps, amounted to an abuse of Facebook's dominant position. The decision effectively prohibits Facebook from combining such data unless voluntary consent is obtained from the user. So again, that's bringing a privacy data issue into a competition issue. And I've already mentioned the unreliable content and fil filter bubble issues. So the point I want to make is that you have to look at these issues 
as a whole. You, you can't separate the competition market power issues from the consumer issues. Um, just as markets need competition, they need informed consumers, and those are squarely within our act. But you can't also separate it from the, the privacy issues. You can't separate it from the ad tech issues, the advertising issues, and you can't separate it from the filter bubble and unreliable news. Because once you start to look at journalism, you do get into that public good issue. And as I say, uh, people calling up on us to stick to our knitting over here means you ignore issues over here. And as far as I'm concerned, it's a common tactic, and I'm not here, I'm talking generally now, as people who don't want the ACCC to get involved in things, to get us to segment down into this, this, and this. Only by looking at issues in the broad can you come up with solutions to them. The more you segment the issues into different lots of organisations dealing with them, the more you just don't deal with these sorts of issues. These issues or other issues. Look, just turning to our proposals, um, we have a lot of them which I'll just mention briefly. Um, we've proposed regulatory oversight of the ranking practices of the digital platforms in relation to news and journalistic content to get a bit of transparency around, here, around what is going on. Uh, this would be done by a regulatory authority, whether it's an existing or new one. Uh, second, we've talked about uh, an independent review by government to make sure that the media restrictions offline are similar to what's there online, to make sure that everybody is playing by the same rules. Uh, third, we've talked about a mandatory standard for improved takedown procedures for copyright infringing content. We've also mentioned some areas for further examination um, whether there's any way of trying to badge content that comes from uh, reputable media sources where that is really defined by who signed up to the standard sort of media codes of conduct that we already have here. So we don't think it's too intrusive and we don't think uh, it would um, in any way interfere with freedom of the press, uh, how much it would benefit uh, people and allow better branding of media is an issue we're still exploring. We've mentioned uh, funding and tax models. Um, wherever you have a public good, uh, of course that does mean there are, because of those externalities, uh, there is a case for government assistance. Uh, the dominant way government intervenes in the media in Australia is through uh, the AB funding of the ABC, uh, which I think is a very important and fundamental role. Uh, we do give fairly low priced access to Spectrum for the TV stations, so there are ways in which we are, uh, the governments are assisting the media, but there's not much there for print, and so we're just posing the question whether there should be. We're looking at the regional and small publishers jobs and innovation package, How's that going? Is that a model to work on? Some have suggested tax offsets for the reduction of certain types of news and journalism, which of course begs the question of how do you define that? And then the idea of making personal subscriptions to news media tax deductible, whether that's something done for a short period of time or a long period of time. Now we understand the problems with uh, tax, with, um, uh, tax incentives. Uh, any tax incentive involves a tax incentive to most people who are going to do what they're doing anyway, uh, whether it's a tax incentive for R&D or anything else, that, that, that issue's the same. The question is, is that the most objective way to deal with the public good issue? So we're very keen to further explore that. And we do have recommendations in relation to privacy, both to improve the Privacy Act and most importantly, separately, to get the digital platforms to enter into a code with ACMA as to how they, with, sorry, with the Privacy Commissioner, as to how they're going to uh, make what they do clearer to consumers and give consumers better chances to opt in or out. So this inquiry is a complex one. Uh, and 
uh, a very important one. Um, we very much welcome comments, particularly on the recommendations and the issues for further analysis. Uh, once we come out with the final report, I don't want anybody saying, why didn't you think of X if you hadn't actually told us about X prior to the end of June? So uh, please, um, ideas, comments on our recommendations, are they workable, are they not workable? Um, I often say the difference between the platforms inquiry and the electricity inquiry, electricity we had basically 12 months, we came out with recommendations, um, we had no chance to put in a draft. Here we have a draft report out there and we now have the chance for comment from everybody on those recommendations in areas for further analysis, so please do that. Thank you. Thank you.